Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to our uh, final series in the Contemporary Issues and Scaling Linking and Equating SIGME um, series, Storytelling the History of Scaling, Linking and Equating and Looking to the Future. So prior to NCME, we had three uh, sessions in this series. Um, we heard from legacy scholars in our field on how they began their journey um, in our field and specifically in scaling, linking, and equating. And now we're hearing from two um, current scholars who are doing ongoing research in scaling, linking, and equating um, today. So we have Han Wook Yu or Henry and Dong Mei Li. So first we'll hear a 25 minute talk from Han Wook, and then we'll hear the same uh, 25 minute talk from Dong Mei, and we'll wait to the end of their presentations for Q&A. So to introduce Henry, um, Henry is a managing senior psychometrician at Educational Testing Service, ETS. At ETS, he manages operational psychometric work for graduate admissions programs and college programs. He received his EdD in Research and Evaluation Measure, uh, Methods program from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. His research interests include measurement and variance across subgroups by both variable-centered and person-centered approaches, construct validity of English language proficiency assessment, applications of IRT to computer-based testing, and innovative score reporting. He is a co-author of a bibliography of research on test score reporting, which is available at the NCME website. So thank you so much, Henry, for, for joining us today and for and for sharing your work with us. Thanks, and Jamie. Uh, I appreciate uh, Stella and Jamie who organized this session, this webinar series. It is an honor to share the SLE-related operational experience with the other SIG members after the legacy scholars. First of all, unlike the previous presenters, um, I'm more like the hands-on psychometrician to hand, uh, handle the day-to-day -day creating and scaling works. So my presentation will be more like a discussion about the current issues that I confront every day. So I wish I could respond back to the previous presenters' perspectives on the gaps and the future directions through what I'm currently working on. <coughs> Excuse me. For your information, the presented several topics for the internally conducted research and then planned ideas for the operational large scale assessments. So I don't provide the detailed analysis results in here. So the first question was that the, what research gaps related to the SLE have I identified or do I have concern for? So based on the, my operational experience, I want to share the one equating research topic that I'm currently working on. So I can't emphasize enough that the, how equating is essential for the operational testing. Without equating, the, we can't link the different forms to provide the valid and fair scores to the test takers who took the test in different times. In many operational testing situations, we commonly equate the test forms with the non-equivalent anchor test design, which we all know as NEAT. And under this equating design, the evaluation of the performance of the anchor items and then identifying the outlier anchor items are for the fundamental steps. Although there were lots of research to evaluate the anchor items, there is no common agreement on preferred methodology with the operational and then practical psychometric works. 11 years ago, Gu and other research, the, the researchers in ETS group presented a review of the commonly used outlier anchor item evaluation approaches and then its flagging criteria at the NCME conference. There are several ways to evaluate the anchor items, but for today's presentation, let's focus on the IRT-based evaluation methods, especially using the item characteristic curves. In context of the IRT, it is common to utilize the differences between the two item characteristic curves to evaluate the anchor item performance across administrations. IRT item parameter-based approaches such as the lowest chi-square tests or the lowest G tests uh, evaluate the differences between the two ICCs indirectly, whether the difference is significantly different from the zero value. Unlike the item parameter methods, Raju proposed to measure the area between the two ICCs, 
the larger area implies that the larger item performance difference. The Raju provided equations and significant task approach for the computing the signed and unsigned area between the two ISDCs. This approach was widely used with the Rush models. Another way to evaluate the anchor items is using the ICC is to directly measure the differences between the expected scores over a range of the theta points or at the point at the largest difference. There are three major statistics for this approach, maximum absolute difference and the mean absolute difference and the root mean square error value. As mentioned, the difference between the two ICCs shows the differences of the expected score on the item across the range of the ability estimates. So the maximum absolute difference of the expected scores provides the largest difference between the two ICCs within the all data points. As rules of thumb for the large scale high stakes assessments, the flagging criteria consider the differences greater than 0.125 as large and then differences between the 0.1 and 0.125 as moderate. In many empirical cases, the largest differences can be found from the extremely low value on data or the extremely high value on data points. The limitation of the area measure and the maximum absolute difference is that they are not considering the sample ability distributions. It is an important issue if the difference between the ICCs occurs in part of the ability scale with the large test takers, such as the data point close to the zero. To overcome this limitation, the two related the statistics, the root mean scale error value and the mean absolute difference between the ICCs are considered, which can have both unweighted and weighted versions. Unweighted differences provide the equal weight to to differentiate the, the, all across the, the ability scale here. And the weighted differences assign the weights according to the number of the examinees at each ability level, which we usually use the 41 data points. A number of the research studies and then statewide assessments use the weighted and unweighted versions of the RMSE or the MAD to evaluate the anchor items. However, the flagging criteria were varied across the different programs. Again, as a rules of thumb, uh, based on the empirical and historical review experience, the differences larger than 0.1 is flagged as a large, and then differences between the 0.07 and then 0.1 as moderate for the large scale high stakes assessment. If the purpose of test is different, such as the interim diagnostic assessment, then the different thresholds have been adopted by the different program. One thing that bothers me in here was that this criteria was universal for both unweighted and weighted version. So the main idea here is that the multiple criteria can be used in evaluating the anchor items. However, the ICC-based methods seem to be more commonly used regardless of the different IRT models for the Rush model 2PL or 3PL. And this is another question to me because we are applying the same rule for the different models in here based on even though we provide the more parameter parameters in the different models in here. So although the ICC differences were evaluated by the different methods, these methods seemed flag similar outlier items in here. That's the main reason. But we still need to think that the, whether the model effects are not, uh, not con should not be considered in the ICC comparisons in here. So um, main idea is that the, it is recommended to use the multiple criteria for both weighted and unweighted the approaches. And anchor item evaluation is a complex process that uh, involves the statistical and judgmental procedures. So even with the same evaluation method, various practitioners and researchers seem to use different threshold value to flag the outlier anchor items or they want to use the consistent rules of thumb that the similar testing programs have been applied before. So many of the flagging criteria do not reflect the statistical test, but rather rules of thumb developed in practice, such as 0.3 or 0.5 with the rush B value difference and the 0.1 or the 0.125 with the root mean scale error. Then why the rules of thumb are more preferred in the practical situation? There are a number of the reasons. First, the 
approach to establishing the cutoff value may not be reliable. For example, the, there are two ICs that are estimated by each sample rather than the rehabbing the two true values. The gaps between the one estimated ICC to the another estimated ICC may be unstable due to the characteristics of the calibrated samples. Second, in practice, especially when the sample sizes are large, the rules of thumb seem to be more tend to flag less items than the flagging rule established solely based on the significance test. We all understand that the removing too many anchor items can threaten the quality of the equating results. So a more a bit the conservative approach from the rule of thumb seemed preferred under the large scale, the high stakes assessment conditions to reduce the false positive rate. However, we don't know the which way is more close to the true value and to equate the test forms more accurately. So we should investigate further how to compare the rules of thumb and then statistical significance test by empirical and simulated data for the practical decisions and then for general consensus, which is I'm currently working on. So next topic that I prepared is the impact of the COVID pandemic on the operational equating works. So during this year, NCME and ARA, I also received several impactful messages from the senior researchers about the changes caused by the COVID-19. I will briefly go through the possible ways to resolve the operational issues related to the scaling, linking, and equating during the pandemic. Due to the COVID-19, operational equating and linking work has been impacted in the various ways. First of all, we can expect a decline in the test volume, which impacted the pretest item calibration work. We expected a certain amount of the test take of responses per pretest item, but it decreased than the one we can accept. So we started to investigate the different approaches to calibrate the pretest items with relatively small volume. So one of the suggested idea was using the simultaneous linking. Second, due to the pandemic, the several testing companies started to offer the remote proctor testing. Remote proctor testing offer the test everywhere rather than a test center. The test is taken on the test taker's own computer at home and then monitored by the remote proctor or online proctor. So to ensure that the test comparability and to preserve the validity of the test score same as before, several, several the statistical analysis, including the test security analysis, should be conducted to closely monitor the remote proctor the administrations. Especially, the item level mode comparison study should be conducted to evaluate the impact on the anchor item calibrations from the different testing modes. Although test volume was decreased due to the pandemic, in my personal opinion, that the pre-test item itself may have enough volumes to produce the stable parameter estimates because our administrative works are uh, properly done before. But the problem here is that the sample sizes for the anchor items bring into the question the quality of the link to the basis scale because of the complex linking design for the adaptive testing and the limited calibration sample selection for the specific group. So the simultaneous linking of approach proposed by the Faberman is considered as a promising solution because item parameters from the numerous calibrations are simultaneously transformed to an established reference scale based on the series of the least scale analysis. This approach allows a massive number of the calibrations to be linked concurrently without generating the large sequence of the linking forms, each reduce the, which reduce the equating errors. So instead of using the one collection of the common items for the sequential linking, items in the whole item bank that provide in the previous test administrations are used for the simultaneous linking analysis. Although it is expected to have a measurement loss due to the data sparseness in the item bank, if we have enough number of the previous administrations, it may be compensated by borrowing some information from the other calibrations. So this approach is perfect for the large scale assessment, especially for the test that provides the test administration continuously. Internally conducted simulation study proved that the simultaneously linked 
item parameter estimate showed better item parameter recovery compared to the sequentially linked item parameter estimates by the stocking and loads TCC approach. It is quite promising, but need to investigate further along with the complex linking design on the various levels of the adaptive testing work. So let's move to the next topic. When the pre-created test is administered by the two different testing modes, there are two options to calibrate the pre-test items. First option is to calibrating the pre-test item responses that are only collected from the uh, one group, which is in this case will be the local test center, same as before. And the advantage of the, this option is that it can avoid any differential mod effects but the disadvantage is that the calibration sample size will be decreased or may not be enough. Another option is that the combining both responses from the two different test modes to calibrate the pre-test items. The advantage of the, this option is that the sample size will represent the total population as same as before, and the sample size will be enough to estimate the parameters adequately. But the disadvantage of the, this option merging data would be there might be a biased impact by the different test modes. Whenever we start providing the two different testing modes, we should conduct the item level and I'm sorry, item level and test level mode comparison study. This study tells us whether item responses from the two test modes can be combined for the item calibration and equating analysis. When many operational testing companies studied the remote proctor testing, most of the cases conducted a post hoc study with available empirical data. So it is obvious that we need to reflect the confounding of the test mode effect and then the ability differences in test takers across both modes. However, this type of analysis, like the using the empirical data itself, is still a practical choice to detect the differential item performance of course, the testing modes when experimental design is not available. So several statistical methods were the, applied to the mode comparability analysis, such as the match samples, propensity score matching, and the article linear regression analysis. Although these methods still can be used to adjust the mode effect, some researchers commented that, that there are potential threats to the validity of the, these methods because of the improper use of the matching variable and the differences in test conditions. And also, also need to consider like the moral motivation or the Hoffman effects and so on and so on. So most ideal design to compare the mode effects is a single group design or the column to balance the random design, which is test taker can take the both the at home test and at center versions of the test so that the correlation between scores can be estimated along with the mode, which is highly unlikely possible. We, we usually don't have that kind of the randomly selected design in the operational situation. And the second best design will be a, the equivalent groups design, which allows for the separating the mode effects from the ability differences so that any differences in performance can be assumed to be a, a kind of the mode effect. And then the less likely the ideal case will be the third best design for the, the anchor test design, which is like using the quality anchor to adjust the group differences in ability before estimating the mode effects. Another approach to compare the different test mode effect that I want to introduce here is that the pseudo equivalent group equality. We call it as a PEG. The PEG procedure, also developed by the Haberman, used the examining background information to construct the sample weights. The sample weights transformed the non equivalent groups of the examine into the pseudo resembled equivalent groups on the selected background variables, and there's therefore that uh, potentially reduced the group differences in ability. So the evaluation was based on this very strong assumption that the PEG removed the between group ability differences across the two modes reasonably well. So if the PEG assumption holds, same as the, the other approaches, uh, the item level mode effects would be the most plausible explanation for any systematic differences between the two groups. So we can evaluate the three possible delta values because I use the delta equating and this kind of the ideas. And then the we compare the results from delta values from the remote proctor testing 
and observed the delta value and equated the delta value and then the PEG applied the delta value. So differences between the equated delta and then the PEG applied delta may indicate that the difference is due to the mode effects only. So if the student background information are available, I strongly recommend conducting this kind of design to control the ability difference first, then the evaluate the anchor item performance differences by two different modes. Those were the current hands-on equating topics that I have been handling in these days. Let's move to the next question that the co-chair suggested. So um, while I'm preparing this presentation, I remember that the how seniors such as the Neil Durant, the Skip Livingstone, Shelby Haberman, and Alina von Davier advised me when I was in trouble to resolve the operational equating and linking issues. So without their thoughtful feedback and suggestions, I might not be able to make a right decision on my operational work. Although I'm not an expert like the Neil or the Olina, I do have a valuable message for the newbies to assist their successful career development if they are considering the operational psychometrician position. So I'm not sure how many of today's audiences are the graduate students, but this slide is targeted to the graduate students who want to get a job in operational testing companies. And I'm a big supporter of the NCME mentoring program. I mentored the graduate students several years. And during the annual mentoring work, I always emphasize that the, even though there are several evaluation criteria for the hiring process, operational hands-on psychometricians would prefer someone who has equating knowledge and experience all the time. So let's briefly review the, some of the job descriptions excerpt for the associate level psychometrician. We all agree that uh, at least we have to have a expertise with the both testing theories in CTT and IRT. And then IRT-based equating approaches are mostly considered at the era of the control-based testing in these days. However, equating itself can be explained without IRT. And if you are not familiar with the fundamentals of the equating work, if you haven't read the Livingston's equating test scores without IRT, I strongly recommend you as a summer reading item. It is open to public, easy to download, and just to Google it, you will find that document so you can, you can download it. And another valuable skill is experience with the statistical analysis software and then programming skill. It can be commercial software or non-commercial software, but please consider developing your own QC process to evaluate the equating and then scaling results. Many graduate students understand the theoretical meaning of the equating, but does not know the detailed steps of the equating. So if you can replicate the equating results by yourself, at least using the simulated data or the example from the commercial program or non-commercial program, it will be valuable asset for your career. Other two skills, problem solving and communication are essential skills for any job positions, not only for the psychometrician. It is expected to have an ability to analyze and research and propose the solutions to the current and future measurement problems. Also, it is expected to have a very strong communication skill in both verbal and written format. Testing companies would prefer someone can demonstrate the complex equating results to the non psychometric co-workers or the clients in plain English. And one last thing that in these days, many of the operational psychometric works are considered to be automated or standardized by the AI or the machine learning. However, the equating and linking scaling is an art of skill that requires the psychometrician's subjective decisions based on the various statistical evidence. So we need to keep investigating how equating work can be improved and standardized and eventually automated. So these are the topics that I prepared today. Uh, we will have a Q&A session later. So Stella and Jamie, could you take a lead for the next step? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Henry. All right, so next we will hear from Dong Mei. Uh, Dong Mei Lee is a lead psychometrician at ACT and has 14 years of operational work experience in providing psychometric support for high stakes, large scale assessment programs. She also has seven years of teaching experience in secondary and post-secondary schools. While at ACT, Dong Mei oversaw psychometric support during the development of the new ACT writing test program 
and routinely serves as interim lead for the design and implementation of new initiatives for the ACT assessment. She has been instrumental in the redesign of the ACT score reports and was a key player in the creation of one of ACT's newer assessment programs, ACT Aspire. Her expertise and research is in test equating and scaling, growth models, mode comparability, vertical scaling, and assessment of English language learners. So welcome, Dong Mei. Thank you so much for sharing your, uh, your time with us today. We can unmute. Okay. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Let's see. Hope it's is it the correct one? Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Domeli. Uh, I'm so extremely honored to be part of this storytelling series. Uh, I'll take a little different approach than Henry. I'm going to. You're seeing this, sorry. <laughs> uh, take you as I revisit my quiet SLE research path over the past 15 years and share with you a few little discoveries that I found along the way and hope you can enjoy. Um, first, a few words about how I ended up in this field. It all started with a random conversation at a dinner table. At that time, I was thinking about going back to school for a PhD in linguistics. However, during that conversation, I found out that actually the department, which is called Educational Measurement Statistics, which I knew nothing about, had something that I'm very interested in to offer that is about testing. And according to that friend, this program was not only good, it was great, super good. So that just changed my plan. And thanks to the friend, I was converted from a potential linguist to a follower of linguist. Uh, by the way, I'm sure you all know that friend because her name is Ye Tong. <laughs> um, this is the research path that I have taken over the past 20 years, starting with graduate schools. In graduate school, my research were almost all related to language. Uh, English language learners or reading or writing. And then starting from my dissertation, I started, and especially after I started to work at ACT, my research is more related to SLE. Uh, I will show these few areas that I have done some research in, growth models and vertical scales, constant conditional SEM and scaling, mode comparability and equating issues. And for each topic, I'm going to use some pictures from previously presentations, uh, presented uh, slides as a clue for my storytelling and share with you a few discoveries followed by some areas um, for future research. First, on um, growth models and vertical scales. These are three presentations that grew out of my dissertation. Uh, a general framework for modeling student progress, uh, empirical comparison, and a theoretical investigation about the mathematical relationships between models. They do not seem to be related to SLE, but in fact, within the framework, one dimension that I identified that growth models can defer was the measurement and scale score uh, consistency. This is foundational for scaling. And also within this presentation, the relationships between those growth models, I identified that these two quantities can be used to predict correlations between some growth models. One is the ratio of standard deviations, and the other is the correlation between initial and final status scores. I didn't realize at that time, but later I realized that these are just properties of score scales. For example, K, if it's greater than one, we have scale expansion. If it's smaller than one, we have scale shrinkage. And those properties are very important for understanding uh, growth models too. Oh, this is just an example about how those two quantities can determine the 
correlation between simple gain and residual gain. And then later in 2013, no, 2013 yeah, uh, the ACT Aspire studied the scaling, equating mode comparability and linking studies. And a lot of my research was motivated by that work. So in this presentation, I just showed that due to different data collection designs, even within a single statistical method, that was the Thurston scaling method, we can get different uh, vertical scales. During that process, I really realized that within a single statistical method, those different options can produce vertical scales that are linearly related. Based on that realization, I further developed another statistical relationship between uh, change scores on two different vertical scales that are linearly related. I found out that this correlation is determined by three quantities. Two were the pre previously mentioned K and rho. The other is M, which is a ratio of slopes between the slopes that are used to construct those vertical scales. And this is a picture showing how the functions look like for different values of those three quantities. Uh, this 2015 NCME presentation further developed that relationship and showed how it can be used to interpret growth results and to determine what your uh, vertical scale would look like for growth models when they are done. Another presentation the same year took a look at the relationships from a slightly different perspective. It showed an earlier relationship that I developed, how it can be useful to interpret growth measures on different vertical scales and how even the student growth percentile can be the relationship of that measure can be interpreted with other measures using that relationship. Just a summary here. So during the process, uh, I discovered some mathematical relationships and found that they were useful. And also I discovered this, probably everybody knows, but everybody ignored property of educational scales. That is, they are all non-interval. I think in Andrew Ho's word, they are pliable. So that led me to this uh, direction for future exploration, not for myself, maybe for you, if you are interested. I don't remember whether you, I don't know whether you remember what Dr. Mark Rukes promised in his March 2009 newsletter, in which he said, uh, what I would like to see happen is that someone develops a scale for educational achievement. That is like one of the temperature scales. I would like to give a prize to the person who did. I definitely thought that he was joking at that time, but after a few years, I saw that some methodologies were developed to detect whether a scale was interval or not. For example, work from Briggs and Domingue, and Domingue 2014. So maybe Dr. Mark Rakes was more serious than I thought. If you are interested in this area, just keep in mind, there is a prize to be won. <laughs> now change the topic to constant conditional SEM scaling, which was also motivated by the Aspire work. In order to obtain a constant conditional SEM scale, at that time, what was available in the literature was only the arc sign transformation, which could not be applied to theta scales. So we proposed this method, which we call the general variance stabilizing method to do scale transformation so that a constant conditional SEM can be obtained, not only for number correct scores, but also for theta scores or any other kind of scores. So long the conditional SEM for the raw score is known. The bottom two presentations were developed five years later. Um, they were mainly responses uh, for some feedback that I saw during the years about using scale transformation to obtain constant conditional SEM. Some researchers think that only computer adaptive testing can do the job, 
they think that skill transformation, you're just manipulating the skill. It doesn't count. <laughs> In one of my presentations, based on uh, simulations, I just compared the two approaches in terms of three uh, aspects. One is how their conditional SEM look like, what is the reliability of the test scores, and what is the score distributions look like. And my conclusion was that, yes, they are fundamentally different, but they are doing the same job of obtaining a constant conditional SEM just on their own scale. So unless we can approve, prove that, oh, IRT theta scores are the only reasonable scale, I believe that both approaches are appropriate. And then another presentation was regarding some other comments that I have seen, which uh, believes that conditional SEM is not as useful as conditional reliability in terms of their description of the about the conditional measuring precision. In that presentation, I just revisited the paradox, uh, which was attributed to method differences and showed that actually they were due to scale score differences or yeah, score scale differences. And then I compared the features of two types of conditional reliability index and identified need for further research because I did not know which better makes more sense. As a summary, so we proposed this GVS method that could be used um, more broadly than arc sign transformation. And I did believe that scale transformation and CAT can do the same job of stabilizing conditional SEM, even though they are on their own scale. And also constant conditional SEM also implies constant conditional reliability if conditional reliability is defined using the total group variance as proposed by these uh, scholars. Areas for further exploration. We noticed that there were some challenges for observing, for obtaining constant conditional SEM in vertical scaling and also in maintaining that property over time. Also, in terms of how to prioritize when there are different scaling roles, goals, uh, when constant conditional SEM is only one of them. Also, thinking of, of the Dr. Mark Rakes Award, this question has been haunting me over the years. I hope you can help. So I keep thinking, I know that equal conditional SEM does not imply equal interval. However, I keep thinking that, oh, if we have an equal interval score scale, does that imply equal conditional SEM? You can think about it and let me know. So change of topic to mode comparability. Uh, I've done some work uh, in this area too, but one major thing that I wanted to point out is this framework that we developed uh, early on, which guided our research about mode comparability and other comparability research. Three guiding principles are um, emphasized here. One is that score comparability is a matter of degree. The required stringency is determined by the purpose of score use. And second principle is that comparability studies should be treated as a process for score validation uh, in which we should gather evidence for both metric or score and construct equivalency. And the third principle is that all potential sources of score and comparability should be examined during the whole process of test, um, from test development to score reporting, et cetera. So we found that this framework it's useful as providing guiding principles in mode comparability research and other score comparability investigations. And notice that mode effects cannot be assumed to not exist for high stakes testing. This is a few areas for further exploration. Uh, more work is needed to identify sources of mode effect. I noticed that there are controversies exist among researchers about how to deal with mode effect. And further research is definitely needed for detection 
of mode effect and for practical solutions. Now, equating issues. These are my three most recent uh, presentations. The top one is pre was presented this year at NCME, which is assessing the impact of equating error on group means. In that, I identified a disconnection between what is commonly used for reporting standard error equating and what we do need to know when we are comparing group means. So I proposed that we can use this statistic. It's very conceptually very easy, just that the standard deviation of the group means after you're applying different conversions, if you can replicate the equating process multiple times. And this statistic can be applied not only in interpreting of group means and group mean differences, but it will also be helpful in determining equating sample sizes if you have a target of that statistic. And I also provide a simple formula to be used for random groups design. Um, the next two presentations are all about population invariance. This one was about whether population invariance holds when we have different groups with different achievement levels. And the results showed that even when the groups that we use for equating are very different, the results are comparable to those that we obtained using random groups. The other presentation, which is going to be presented next week at IMPS, is investigation of population invariance of equating under COVID-19 because we've seen a lot of concerns about doing equating in COVID. So using an uh, intact test form that was administered both before COVID twice and during COVID, by using pseudo test forms, uh, we created post um, hoc equating designs to investigate whether single group designs uh, random groups to that common item design, embedded field test design pre-equating would differ, whether you equate using the sample before COVID and after COVID. The results showed that this is the effect sizes of group mean differences. So by looking at the magnitude, I wouldn't say they are big at all. Um, by using the statistic that I proposed this year at NCME here in the parenthesis, we can see that the observed effect sizes were actually almost all within the what is expected from random equating error. So, oh, by the way, I also did uh, some uh, studies related to scale stability. One is based on real data, short-term stability, and another was a presentation by Hongling Dongmei and Deb Harris 10 years ago about using simulated data. Anyway, none, in none of these studies, I observed alarming um, evidence for scale instability. Okay, so this is a summary of the discoveries. So we found additional evidence for population inverse of equating results, first for groups that differed in achievement levels, and second, um, populations before and one year after the pandemic. Also proposed a useful statistic that can be used to quantify the impact of equating error on group means. And I did notice some practical issues in scale stability. So areas for further exploration. So population invariance, whatever you call it, is a fascinating area for me. Uh, for, I think it deserves some more research. I think it's more a lot um, related actually to the equity property of equating to the concept of score comparability. And there's also something to do, I believe, between local equating and this property. Another area was that I think that we need a more systematic way to summarize and present equating error, measurement error, and sampling error. Also, 
more research is needed for detection and prevention of scale drift and about user tolerance and practical decisions on when to rescale. You may be bored with all those trivial findings, but this is my biggest one ever. <laughs> I noticed some commonalities between educational score scales and human languages. Here are some of them. They, are, they both have meanings and they both drift. They both can be linked or translated, but sometimes it just does not work. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Also thank Stella and uh, Jamie again for giving me this precious opportunity. And I also would like to thank my family, friends, colleagues and professors for their guidance over the years, whether it's sunny or rainy, stormy or calm. Thank you. Thank you, Dongmei. Um, thanks for everyone who joined uh, this webinar. I think it's a bit late introduction of myself. I'm, uh, I'm Stella Kim, uh, one of the co-chairs of this last SIGMI. And uh, sorry for uh, some confusion and mess uh, for connecting the right Zoom link if you are not able to attend this session from the very earlier, uh, you know, from the beginning. Um, the, the Zoom link uh, that was in the uh, previous announcement uh, sent today was a bit, uh, it was a wrong one. So um, sorry for the confusion for that. So um, we'll move on to the uh, questions if anyone has. Uh, so we have one question from Andrew. And it was for Dong Mei. So the question is, why are equal CSMs useful for score interpretation? They seem like a rather technical safeguard for score users when there is a uniform distribution of consequences across the scale of range. Do constant uh, CSMs also help for score interpretations? So do may do you have the answer for this question? Yeah, I can try to answer, Andrew. Uh, thank you for the question. I think from my perspective, I think uh, this was also talked about by Dr. Brennan, Dr. Colin before. I think uh, having this property just uh, make the in score interpretation easier. You don't have to report individual conditional SEM for all score points, but can just like the ACT, you can say the conditional SEM is approximate two for all the score scales along the score scale. And also, I don't think, I don't know whether it's true, but I think it's a fairness issue. Um, it makes more sense to me that people are assessed with equal conditional SEM. Thank you. Um, is there any question? If you have any questions, just feel free to uh, you know, use the chat box to raise your question or please unmute, unmute yourself to, to, to give their questions to the presenters. Oh, by the way, I saw uh, Andrew's question, first part of his question, how much cash did Mark offer as an award for the prize? And he said, if I had the money. <laughs> Any other questions from the attendees? Nope. Okay. Um, Jamie, do you have a question? No, I, no, I don't actually. Thanks. Okay, so um, I think it's time to wrap, wrap up the session. So thanks for everyone who joined us today. Uh, and sorry for the confusion at the beginning, uh, but glad that we could figure it out. Um, so as you know, this is the last session of our SLASIGMU webinars. Uh, and we had uh, three uh, sessions already. 
from the middle of April, I think, uh, to uh, the middle of um, May. And then after the NCME uh, conference, we, uh, we wanted to wrap uh, this uh, session with the two emerging uh, or active scholars in the field. So uh, glad that we could have those two you know, uh, research, researchers who are active in the field and it was good to hear from uh, uh, Helny and Dongmei uh, today. So thanks again for uh, your contribution to make this webinar series uh, uh, as, as a success. So as a wrap up, uh, I'd like to mention some of the research, I mean, some of the plans for our um, uh, planned activities or um, you know, uh, initiatives that we are currently planning on. So the first one is uh, we'd like to have a member um, survey again. I, uh, if you are a member of the, uh, from the very uh, foundation of this SIGMI, you were invited to, uh, uh, to be part of this, uh, the survey sent earlier last year. But since then, we have never had a you know, member survey. So we'd like to have one more survey, which will be sent out uh, uh, pretty soon, which will ask you to, you know, what kind of activities do you expect from this, uh, our SIGMI and, you know, any thoughts about, you know, your involvement uh, in this last SIGMI. So as you may know, this is a pilot, uh, you know, activity that NCME has planned and that will be evaluated uh, by the end of next year which will be sometime next April prior to the NCME conference. And then um, they will determine if we can you know, go uh, further or not. So uh, we'd like to take your input to, to kind of you know, guide us to de uh, design and implement uh, future activities for the remainder of the year. Uh, and then um, we had a member meeting last, I think it was last uh, month. And then we also had some input from the member meeting. So we'd like to kind of you know, utilize those information obtained from members to kind of guide them, guide us to uh, design the future plans. And then another thought that we had is to have the uh, training session for graduate students. So if you are interested in either presenting uh, or you know, as like a lecturer for our graduate students, uh, feel free to email us. Uh, we'll be happy to have a volunteer uh, for that. And if you're, uh, you know, if you have any thoughts on um, that, and if you're interested in, you know, being involved in that activity, uh, just uh, don't hesitate to contact us. So those are the, um, the activities that we plan on for the future. And uh, we appreciate your input in advance. And we look forward to seeing you in another uh, SLE, uh, SLE SIGMI activities. So I uh, hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of the day. And Jamie, do you have any other thoughts to share? Uh, no, that's all. Thanks, you covered them. OK. And Dongmei, uh, Helny, you, do you have anything to uh, say? For... No, I, I really appreciate that you gave uh, a chance to talk about the, what current research hands-on work has been done for the psychometricians and then other works in here too. So I'm also happy to see the, all the other University of Iowa people and then ACT team members in here too. Yeah. Dongmei? Uh, nothing else from me. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for everyone again uh, for being uh, here today with us. And then, um, bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Everyone. Thank you.